Hello and welcome back to Tech Comics. Today we'll be looking at the golden age of comics and the rise of the superhero. During the end of the Great Depression and throughout World War II, comics were starting to become popular enough to garner a wide variety of comic styles popping up. Westerns, action, comedy, mystery, romance, literary classics, horror, all of these were only growing in number. And the demand was driving publishers to hire more artists and more writers to keep up. Then, out of the seeming void came Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster, like a comet, bringing forth their hero to action comics number one. Certainly, there had been action heroes before, even costume ones, but never any who did not rely on magic or gadgets to perform their deeds. Instead, Superman was a superhero, having powers far beyond the ken of mortal man. It had actually taken the duo many years of pitching the character to different publishers before he finally found his place in action comics. And as even those who do not read comics know, Superman's popularity only grew as the series progressed. In June of 1938, with the true birth of Superman, the golden age of comics began. It started a comic book revolution which has, to the benefit and detriment of the industry, carried through to this day. Readers were slow to pick up superhero comics at first, but soon devoured the issue starring Superman and wanted more superheroes. On May of 1939 in Detective Comics 27, the son of Krypton met his dark reflection in the Caped Crusader. Grim and gritty, The Dark Knight was created by Bob Kane and Bill Finger, though the writer would not get his name on the cover and indeed little credit for decades to come. Being the shrewd businessman that he was, Bob Kane positioned himself as the star of the duo, and Bill Finger's fame was greatly diminished, despite having created the infamous villain, the Joker, as well as the scalloped cape. While the mythology of many characters, including Batman, was shaped by Bill Finger and others to work on the series, Bob Kane did come up with Batman himself, and unlike Siegel and Schuster, he firmly negotiated his contract to benefit him greatly, including taking half of Bill Finger's pay. Through the years, Batman has become sanitized and then brought back to his dark origins, even darker than before. But his popularity has grown larger than Superman's because he was a mere mortal, an impossibly well-trained, highly intellectual individual with a costume and gadgets that would put him on par with many superheroes, but mortal nonetheless. Anyone could imagine themselves being Superman, and indeed many children tried to fly off of garage roofs and trees only to fall to the ground in pain and embarrassment if they even survived. Batman, on the other hand, needed money to fund his heroic exploits, and while fans could imagine themselves as him, they were more grounded with their lack of a grappling hook. To this day, fans have debated who is the better hero, and the rivalry between the two characters became even more fractured with the introduction of other superheroes, whether they had superpowers or not. Then, in May of 1939, Wonder Comics came out with the character Wonder Man. Having powers nearly identical to Superman, DC was furious and sued the publisher, Victor Fox. The court decided in DC's favor, and though there was Wonder Comics number 2, no Wonder Man was in it, and the series ended with that second issue. Comics was becoming a serious issue with lawsuits filed between publishers, as many others sought to imitate and capture some of the fame of Superman and Batman. In 1939, in a book called Motion Pictures Funnies Weekly, Timely Comics introduced an 8-page black-and-white story in the back of it, starring their first and longest-running superhero, Prince Namor the Submariner. The story would later be expanded and appear in Marvel Comics No. 1. Later, in October of the same year, when Marvel Comics No. 1 was released, other characters appeared, including the original Human Torch, the Angel, and Kazar. Each of these characters would later be used in other series, as Timely Comics became Atlas Comics and finally become the behemoth that is Marvel Comics. In January of 1940, Pep Comics No. 1 hit the stands, starring The Shield. This character was the first patriotic American hero and would inspire a fight for imitators, the popular Captain America soon overshadowing him entirely. In February of the same year, more Fun No. 52 revealed a mistake by DC in the form of a superhero too powerful to remain popular. A police officer who had died and been sent back by God as a ghost, the Spectre had unlimited power and would turn villains to ash. Cold, humorless, and unstoppable, the Spectre would soon wane and be discarded for many years. DC has brought the character back with variation four times and one with an ongoing series. Also in the same month, Wiz Comics No. 2 came out with Captain Marvel. And Flash Comics came out from DC, featuring The Flash and Green Lantern. Now, DC fought to end Wiz Comics' popular character and eventually bought out both the character and many others from different publishers. But due to Marvel Comics' name and legal battles with their rival's own Captain Marvel, the character would be handled lightly to prevent further complications. The very first superhero sidekick came out in April of 1940 with Detective Comics number 38. Robin the Boy Wonder joined Batman, and the dynamic duo would only grow in popularity as children could imagine being him, if not the Cape Crusader himself. They could do so with relative ease, as he was a character they could easily relate to. This ease of being able to relate to Robin would later inspire many other sidekicks, as well as many younger superheroes, including Spider-Man. In the winter of 1940, this first superhero team formed. 
Called the Justice Society of America, it appeared in All-Star Comics number 3, starring The Flash, The Green Lantern, Spectre, Hawkman, Doctor Fate, The Hour Man, The Sandman, Adam, and Johnny Thunder. Each character was relatively popular in their own series, but the readers devoured the team-up, and creating superhero teams grew until it became common in our modern age. In 1941, All-Stars number 8 came out, with Wonder Woman's first appearance. Origin would continue in Sensation Comics number 1 before she would finally get her own series in six months. Being one of the first female superheroes, she was created by Dr. William Moulton Marston, the inventor of the lie detector, under the pseudonym Charles Moulton. She first started out as the Justice Society secretary, but soon Wonder Woman would go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Batman and Superman alike and hold her own, becoming a feminist role model, despite her outfit being skimpier than many other feminist role models of the time. In March of 1941, Captain America appeared in his own series, never before having been tested in another book, something unheard of at the time. Not only that, but he was seen punching Adolf Hitler on the front cover. Timely Comics publisher Martin Goodman saw the rough sketch of Captain America by comics legend Joe Simon, and knowing it was sell, he bypassed the testing period. To Timely Comics' joy, the series was a success, and the character remained popular to this day. He wasn't an alien like Superman. Captain America was a regular citizen before receiving the Super Soldier Serum, and one of the many early science heroes as a result of his origin. In addition, good old Cap was fighting Nazis long before the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, and would continue to fight during World War II for as long as superhero comics were still popular. Also in the same year, Pep Comics number 22 came out, not with a superhero, but a boy in a love triangle named Archie Andrews. Publisher MJL Magazines would later change its name in 1943 to Archie Comics, which still prints out stories of the character and many other today. After World War II, however, superhero comics began to lose popularity, and other genres rose for a while before the industry itself began to drop, ending the golden age of comics, with the arrival of the scariest thing to come to comics, censorship. That's it for this week, but next week we'll be talking about the Comics Code Authority and many other things in a dark era for comics. Stay tuned for more of Tech Comics, and I'll catch you on the flip side.